Welcome to the first lecture in English 193, Communication in the Sciences. This lecture is titled Rhetoric from Ancient Greece to Canada Geese. Uh, there is meant to be some humor in this. Uh, we'll start out with a very practical uh, but short history of where rhetoric comes from in the ancient Western world, anyway, and end on something more topical and local to University of Waterloo. Let's start with some basic definitions, because there are multiple when we talk about rhetoric. What do we actually mean when we say the word rhetoric? Here are some uh, colloquial and cultural definitions. On a technical level, rhetoric is the art of oration, which is a fancy word for public speaking. So you may have heard this word if you took a debate class, either in secondary education or already in your university studies. More generally, rhetoric is a mode of persuasion when we're giving a speech or in written communication, which is very much tied to the idea of forming an argument. In order to get someone on side with what we're arguing, we need to somehow persuade them, and that requires rhetoric. A more strict definition, which I'll discuss in a couple of minutes, has to do with argument, but also this idea of dialectic. So sometimes rhetoric can be seen as a way to either push back or um, to counter another form of argument. Often rhetoric has multiple underlying layers of meaning because it involves word choices. And as you are probably well aware, every word that we choose comes colored with its own history and also its own personal connotations, how we've encountered it in the world elsewhere, and also the context in which it's being used. So rhetoric can be a way to infuse further meaning into the specific words that we choose. And lastly, rhetoric is often referred to in the political realm as a form of posturing. And this has to do with communicating an idea or a set of beliefs, which we'll use the word ideology here to mean and represent that. So rhetoric um, can sometimes get a bad rap uh, when we speak about politics, especially in North America, because it's referred to as a way to communicate to one's political base. And I'll discuss a little bit more about that in a couple of the next slides. The main point that I want to make at this juncture is that Rhetoric is integral to all forms of communication if we think about it carefully. Something that may not seem apparent, but is very much embedded in our lives these days, is visual rhetoric. Because images have their own sort of persuasive capacity. If we look to the left, we'll see um, a print done in 1890 by Edmund Ollier as part of the Illustrated Universal History of early Greek, of early and Greek history. Um, and this is an oration seen by Demosthenes, who was a, a Greek uh, poet and philosopher. And you'll see the way that he's gesturing. And this is meant to, with one hand on the sort of parapet or, or platform, grounding his thoughts, and another with a pointing finger. And this, as well as the, the other, um, sort of details of the image and his size and scale give him much prominence. And he's clearly the most important figure in this print. However, um, those things we learn through our culture of interpreting images and especially through simple things like scale. So the size and positioning of something in an image is a form of rhetoric because it places more importance on it versus other subjects or details within that image. Oral rhetoric should be fairly obvious because when we speak to one another, we often use various strategies of persuasion. Textual, meaning the written form, which is what we'll be concentrating on most in this class, how even science writing has rhetoric embedded within it and the way that we communicate about information is always laced with some level of persuasion. And lastly, there's physical rhetoric, and this is more about gesture and body language. Um, much of our communication happens, you know, through words, whether they're written or spoken, 
but we know from science and also from practical experience that a, a huge portion of our communication happens visually through signals and cues that we send through our bodies, through gestures, through the way that we hold ourselves, through the um, even the space, how close we are to somebody else that we're trying to communicate with. These all send signals about how important and how persuasive we're trying to be in what we say. The origins of rhetoric in Western culture, and I want to be specific here when I say Western culture because there are origins of rhetoric in Eastern culture as well, particularly in India, um, having to do with the Nyaya Sutras, which is a, a, a body of texts, a Vedic texts that were um, also seen as a form of oration and uh, spoken performance in Indian culture. But since we're dealing with specifically the, the domain of English in this course, we're going to look mostly to ancient Greece and Rome. And rhetoric in the Western world began somewhere around the 8th century BCE, so 800 years before the birth of Christ in ancient Greece, and mostly as a form of education for young people. Students were trained to develop tactics of persuasion in the way that they spoke in schools, and this prepared them for life in Greek society, which often involved either being involved in law, many people in ancient Greek society were um, involved in legal aspects and needed to make arguments and cases before the court, and also Greek society, as you probably are aware, uh, pivoted on public assembly because that was the true democratic model of government. Everybody in the municipality came together and all sort of duked it out in one big forum. So rhetoric was especially important to the way that one spoke and orated in that context. The art of persuasion, along with grammar and logic in ancient Greek society, formed the three ancient arts of discourse known as the trivium, and this continued through the Middle Ages. The most prominent figure that you're probably going to find in ancient Greek history, as far as rhetoric goes, is Aristotle, although he's definitely not the only one. But he defined rhetoric in a, in a particular way as the faculty of observing, in any given case, the available means of persuasion. This definition is unique and useful because it also means that to perform rhetoric, we first need to observe and witness it. So rhetoric is something that we learn from the culture around us in the way that language is used. We synthesize it, and then we deploy it ourselves in order to advance our own interests and arguments in the world. According to Aristotle, he came up with this triangular model where he said that there were three main ways of appealing to someone else's sensibility, and that at any point in an argument, at least one, if not more, of these three different ways are present in the strategy. The first and possibly most obvious one is logos, which means logic. So we like to appeal to someone's rational um, side of their brain and say, this argument is sound and it benefits X or Y because of these other rational sort of indisputable factors. Logos often has to do with practical applications and things that are generally agreed upon. There's a consensus about the factors um, involved, and this supplies the logos appeal. Alongside that, we also, throughout society, uh, often appeal to people's sense of ethics. Ethos, which is slightly different than ethics in the way that we use the word in today's um, contemporary parlance, means someone's sort of um, culturally grounded set of beliefs that inform their way of life. So when we appeal to the ethos part of, of uh, someone's sensibility in rhetoric, we're talking about their, yes, their morals and their beliefs, but also their sense of community and local culture. What's good for the greater good, in other words. And then lastly, in the system, we have pathos, which is appealing to people's emotions. And obviously, this is probably the most direct way to get someone onto your side of an argument, because emotions, we know, 
um, are felt as well as thought about. Aristotle also suggested that there were five offices or phases of development in rhetoric when one is forming an argument. So we can think about these as steps along the way of developing an argument. First, there's invention, which is another way of saying that we have to come up with our main point, and then possibly any constellating surrounding points. Then we have arrangements, so we organize them, we put them into a particular sequence that we think makes sense and that will make sense to others. Importantly, we have style. There's many different ways to, um, to format an argument, and style can also involve uh, really important things like the words that we use, the, the tone of our voice, whether it's in speaking or in writing, and also the when I say format, the medium. So do we, do we write an article? Do we go out into the public square and have a rant? Do we make a video about what it is that we're arguing? These are all stylistic decisions. In ancient Greece, memory was a really important part of this because there was not access to writing uh, for the most part, unless you were employed as a scribe. So if you wanted to argue, you had to memorize your speech as well. And then delivery, which has its own sort of performative aspects. So delivery and style are interrelated, but delivery comes down to the actual way that it's presented, and that can deal um, with visual aspects too. So especially when we think about um, uh, someone who's appealing and making an argument in a video, let's say online on a social media platform, what else do they in, uh, choose to include in the shot? How are they, how are they framed? Um, what are the actual things that go into the visual presentation alongside the oral presentation? We're gonna get rid of memory from this formula because it doesn't really apply to our contemporary society anymore, but these other four of the five offices still are really useful to think about a step-by-step -step procedure of developing an argument. Now, Aristotle differed from his predecessor, who is Plato. What you're seeing here on the right is a little excerpt from the School of Athens fresco by Raphael. Um, famous Italian artist of the Renaissance, and you'll see that the gestures, the hand gestures between uh, Plato, who is on the left, and Aristotle, who is on the right, indicate their sort of, um, their countering beliefs in general about philosophy and society. Plato is pointing up to the heavens because he believes in universal truth, while Aristotle is gesturing to the ground because he believes in context and that the material uh, and social formations of the time should inform how society is governed. So we end up with two, between the teacher and the student, different perspectives on rhetoric. And it's useful to think about these because they both are with us today. Plato, who was more conservative, defined the scope of rhetoric according to his negative opinions of the art. He lived during the time of the Sophists, who were the most sort of popular and powerful political party in the public assembly in ancient Greece, and they mostly used rhetoric, according to him, as a means of deceit. So being persuasive for Plato in a public forum meant that you were also trying to deceive whoever your audience was, instead of, in his own sort of words, discovering truth together. His pupil, Aristotle, however, defined the scope of rhetoric as much broader and intrinsic, meaning that it was sort of uh, an integral part of what it, mean to make, what it means to make art and to express oneself. And here's a quote from Aristotle. It is absurd to hold that a man should be ashamed of an inability to defend himself with his limbs, for the use of rational speech is more distinctive of a human being than the use of his limbs. And what Aristotle is trying to say in this quote, or what's uh, agreed upon as an interpretation, is that rhetoric and the ability to persuade another being through speech and through language, more importantly, is the defining characteristic in many ways of what it means to be human. So if we take persuasion as something deceitful or or harmful, then we also sort of bring into question 
what it means as humans to communicate with one another, since we all try to use our words and language in order to get what we want in the world. The main point about this is that the Platonic interpretation of rhetoric is actually more popular in the scientific community, because in general, scientists have been trained over the past few centuries to, if not believe, then to certainly um, uh, believe in an ideal that science communication should not have any rhetoric involved in it, that to have rhetoric in science communication means to get too personal and to no longer become, or no longer be, I should say, objective in that scientific work. But the reality is that SciComm isn't devoid of rhetoric at all, because, number one, scientists are human subjects too. Because you're involved in scientific research, it doesn't mean that you stop being human, and because all of that research is communicated through language, if we take Aristotle's point, then it must involve some degree of rhetoric. Also, communicating new knowledge and concepts requires persuasive language. This is because most people in society are hesitant or even scared of new knowledge and concepts, because generally humans don't like change. So bringing people onto your side and getting them to accept change requires persuading them. The next quote is from an article that I recommend by Daniel Sarowitz, for the New Atlantis, published in 2016, called Saving Science, and I think it's very relevant to this lecture and our conversation to come. So, bias is an inescapable attribute of human intellectual endeavor, and it creeps into science in many different ways, from bad statistical practices to poor experimental or model design to mere wishful thinking. If biases are random, then they should more or less balance each other out through multiple studies. But, as numerous close observers of the scientific literature have shown, there are powerful sources of bias that push in one direction. Come up with a positive result, show something new, different, eye-catching, transformational, something that announces you as part of the elite. So, what Sarowitz is trying to say here is that Particularly in the scientific research community, there is a pressure put upon us all as researchers and publishers to get our work out there, to get it noticed, to do something new, radical, transformational. This is what, you know, quote unquote, has value in scientific research. And above all of this, then once you do that, you get to become part of this, quote unquote, elite group of people who are, you know, these scientists who are changing the world, so to speak. And this pressure, no matter what branch of science you practice in, is there if you want to proceed and become an academic and teach, because publishing is essential to being a tenure-track um, academic. So, Sirowitz's point in a lot of ways is that the system itself of scientific research and publication encourages bias because the rhetoric becomes so much about belonging to this, um, this group of scientists who have been, you know, approved and given credence for their, again, I'm quoting here, different, eye-catching, and transformational work. This is a concern that relates in many ways to the research of a humanities scholar named Kenneth Burke, who passed away in 1993. Burke is probably the most well-known rhetorician of the 20th century. He was a theorist, a philosopher, and a poet, and many of his books are central to what we think of as modern rhetorical theory. You can see a list of the sort of the top three here. What I want to talk about specifically with Burke is his concept of identification, and what he meant by this is that the role of rhetoric um, in defining one's identity happens mostly through the social contract of language and the idea that we have to cooperate in language in order to participate in society and live our lives. The result of this, Burke said, is that once we belong to a certain community, and in this case let's say the scientific research community, then the rhetoric that gets used in that social group becomes the way that we identify. 
So the language that's used in order to persuade others and in some ways persuade ourselves that we belong to this community is crucial to our identity formation. Therefore, rhetoric is a component of human identity and identification. A distinction that Burke made with his work is that while Aristotle had a generally optimic or sorry, a generally optimistic view of rhetoric and was more interested in how it was formulated and constructed, Burke was interested in deconstructing rhetoric in order to figure out what are the social factors and formations that make this thing tick and so central to our society. And for a last little perspective, a more contemporary one, one of the most prominent female um, scholars working in rhetoric today is Krista Ratcliffe, who is professor and chair of English at Arizona State University in the United States. And she came up specifically with this idea of rhetorical listening, which she grounds in a feminist perspective. And it's the idea that rhetoric is not only persuasive speech and writing, but also the art of reception. And if we go back to Aristotle, where he said that rhetoric is the faculty of, of observing persuasive tactics, this makes a lot of sense. In order to deploy rhetoric, we must first be able to perceive and comprehend it. And Ratcliffe extends this even further to say in her 2005 book, Rhetorical Listening, that by fostering not only rhetoric in spoken and written communication, but also in listening, one might foster and increase cross-cultural communication because we need to be able to identify with the perspectives of others before we can learn how to be persuasive about our own perspectives on a topic. All right, that concludes the first part of the lecture. I'm going to pause here before we do a little application of those concepts and I'll see you on the other side.